Where would you be without the mercy of God, the grace of God, the loving kindness of God? The God that sent his son to die for you so that you might have life. Where, where would you be today without it? And I thank God for his mercy for each and every one of us. And uh, today might be more merciful to others than, that, some, than others. I'm not sure yet. So uh, today we continue our series of messages on the relevant 10. Never have we lived in an era that thinks that the 10 commandments somehow do not apply as we do today. It seems that the 10, and talking about just the 10, or sometimes even the entire Old Testament, has been put on the back shelf, back burner by theologians, Christian and non-Christians. Somehow to say that it's not, doesn't mean anything. Some pastors have done the same thing and decided that the um, Old Testament does not mean, or people in the pews sometimes, and of course, people in general. As we mentioned last week, the first four of the ten deal with our relationship with God. And the last six deal with our relationship with each other. And what the key is, is that our relationship with God, meaning the first four, will affect what we do in the last six. The ten. No other gods before Yahweh. No carved images to worship. Do not take Yahweh name in vain. Remember the Sabbath, and of course, in our, the Sabbath meaning the Lord's Day, the day that you've set aside for, to worship Him and to focus on the Lord God and the Lord God alone. Honor your father and your mother. And last week we looked at no murder. And today, we get to look at no adultery. Found in Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 14, page 52 or page 41 on that pew Bible. I know that you can preach this message in two or three different ways. So uh, I'm thankful for the songs we've just sung because uh, you'll find out that uh, how I look at this entire subject in just a moment. In spite of the fact that the great majority of Americans believe that adultery is a deplorable Act, our society has chosen to make adultery non-relevant. According to the scripture, it says you will not commit adultery. In many states, adultery is still a crime, but no one is arrested for it. Other states, it's a misdemeanor. Again, no one is arrested for it. A recent poll shows that 44 out of 10 Americans believe that adultery is morally acceptable. Maybe you didn't hear that. 40% of Americans believe that adultery is morally acceptable. And by the way, one out of every 10 Christians believe that. Even though God has made it very relevant from the very time he gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai. So first of all, let's look at the Sinai principle. The actual picture you see is of Mount Sinai. It takes you about three hours to climb it, about an hour and a half to come down it. And then, uh, of course, one guy stayed up there 40 days and 40 nights. And there's certain places that you, could, you cannot do that. You know, I don't think, but you might can. The principle was so important to God. This very principle, along with the other nine, that the first tablet given to Moses was one that God himself wrote. God himself etched in stone and gave to him. It was so important, this particular aspect, because of the effects that it has on families and individuals. So let's just, I know you probably know the meaning of it, but I'll just give you the meaning. It is the sexual relationship of a married man with a female, not his wife, and that of a married, man, married woman with a man, not her husband. The punishment in Old Testament times was death. But we do not have a recorded uh, time, even in all of Scripture, where that happened. I'm not saying that it did not happen, but there's not one recorded. I believe there's a reason. It does give us a record of famous adulterers, okay? And so I want to talk to you a little bit about David and Bathsheba, okay? 
the most famous committers of adultery is found in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel, beginning in verse 1 through 27, we will not read all of them. Most of you know the story. We're told that it was in the springtime when kings go out to war. You know the reason why they go out to war in the, king, in the spring? Because there's no rain and the chariots don't get bogged down. It's after the second rain, second, uh, uh, rain. and so therefore he decided though, David decided to sit home. He decided according to scripture, they destroyed. Um, this happened one evening, but David remained in Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the house he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to be beheld. behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, it is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Then David sent messengers and they brought her. And, and the reason why they were talking about it is because they committed adultery together we normally want to blame David we somehow want to make sure that David we understand about David but also Bathsheba is not an innocent person in this point she also willingly came and also committed adultery on her side too they committed adultery together and let me just tell you it caused David to break six out of the ten commandments when he did. He wasn't just one. He caused him to do six. He went against God. When he gets God's pure righteousness, he went against, he caused an individual to be murdered. So therefore, if you cause a person, we found out that last week, that if you cause a person to be murdered, you are also just as guilty. He committed adultery. He cheated by saying that he tried to get her husband to go to his wife when, she, when he came home. You can read the story. He lied about Uriah's Uriah's uh, sacrifice and he coveted his wife that is what committing adultery does it's a downward spiral against God the Old Testament it will tell you that you know kill kill them kill them both the law says such we sometimes think the Old Testament and the and uh, and the law has no place for grace, has no place, place for forgiveness, has no place whatsoever for somehow to God in a loving manner would be able to restore an individual. And I will tell you that is the very opposite of what happens to David and Bathsheba. And that's the, actually the, the story. That's not only the story, but it's the lesson that you and I need to understand today, given all of the ones from all of the Ten Commandments. There's always God's grace and forgiveness for each and every one of them, including the one that we talk about today. If you were, turn over to Psalm 51, it's a psalm that David would write. It's a, to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan, the prophet, was sent in to show him where he was wrong and after he'd gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, grace. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my sins, blot out my transgressions, blot out those things. Why? Because why can you blot it out? Because he has forgiven them. He's asking forgiveness. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. God will call it an evil thing that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out again. He says it the second time, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from thy presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And then he says, restore to me that joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. 
he then goes on to say, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And I love verse 15 where it says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. What God has done, he forgives him. He restores him. And yes, he fills him with a praise of the Lord. Why? Because he's asked for forgiveness. He's gone in repentance before God. And God is willing always to forgive. I want us to understand that that's the message of the Old Testament when it comes to each one of these Ten Commandments. Each one of them, God says, I will forgive you. I ha- and he has done so and he showed that he has done so in every case, at least one example of all of them. I want you to understand that's where we are as well. I want you to know that that's the message that God wants us to have when it comes to David and Bathsheba. All oh, they paid consequences for it. Don't get me wrong. We do not somehow turn a blind eye to it. But I want you to understand something. There comes a point where forgiveness and restoration and being filled by God's praise is the result of repentance, no matter what the law that has been broken. I want you to notice, second of all, the replacement principle. That's what we've done here in our day and age. That's what we've done in in a modern America. We've replaced adultery with something I'll show you what Jesus' approach is in just a minute but let's look at modern society our world has replaced adultery with socially acceptable affairs we do not hear of adultery issues that much unless it's in a divorce court but affairs and it seems like we've blessed affairs affairs or adultery I ask you It has become acceptable because somehow there are certain excuses that people use all the time. And maybe you've heard some of them. I'm in an unloving relationship. My spouse is cold. God wants me to be a love and experience love. So I need to find it wherever I can. God wants me to be happy. So therefore I need to go look for it. In a recent poll, one-third of married men, listen to me, will cheat. And we're not talking about Jesus' view. We're talking about the actual physical cheat. One-fourth of married women will cheat. And one-third of all marriages that end in divorce, they end in divorce because of affairs or adultery. And some are justified in doing so because God gives us and the Lord Jesus gives us that opportunity or at least that, uh, that acceptance of it. But here's the striking one. People born between 1940 and 1959. Hmm, okay. Somewhere between 70 and 89 right now. But if you were born... Wait a minute. That's wrong. I got to go back a little bit. (laughs) 60 and 89 maybe. Uh, People born from 1940 to 1915, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, report the highest rate of extramarital affairs. Oh. Well, I thought I was going to get a slide. I'm going to slide by on this one. I'm an older individual. I'm just telling you that that's, the statistics are there. But you know what's worse than that? It's now acceptable to have an organization that has 16.9 million people that belong to this particular group that they promote discreet extramarital affairs. Ashley Madison, if you don't know what I'm talking about. And the number one city with the highest percentage of the population that are members of this organization, members of this group, guess what? Austin, Texas. We knew they were weird anyway. (laughs) 
Now we know how more how to pray for them. My goodness. We have a society that accepts replacement of husbands, replacement of wives, and it has its toll on families. We're told that adulterous behavior by parents seems to, it doesn't always do it, please understand I'm not generalizing them all, to beget similar behavior in their children when grown. Is there any hope? What are we as Christians supposed to do when this comes about? When we know of people that this happens? Jesus gives us the answer. I call it the heart principle. If you'll turn over to Matthew, the fifth chapter. I'll read two verses. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus teaches us that like murder, the act of adultery begins in your heart begins with a motivation begins with with conjuring up a way in which to do it verse 27 and 28 you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not commit adultery but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart whoever looks at another woman with lust now let's understand something. That does not mean that every time you look at, another, at a woman that you lust after them or you've committed adultery. It's only when you look and lust, okay? But that also means the opposite way, by the way. That also means for you ladies too, you're not left alone here. Not that, you know, it could also happen the other way. It means that all sexual impurities in thought, in word, in deed, anything that leads up to it, Jesus is putting in this verse. That would include our computers and chat rooms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You see, it's a hideous and heinous command when it's broken. That's the reason why that God is so much against it. Jesus is telling us the problem is not all just not physical. It's not physical. It is spiritual. From the depths of our heart, we are to reject adultery in favor of righteousness. No matter who we are, it does not make any difference who we are. We then will see Jesus' reaction to that. And I call it go and sin no more. John the 8th chapter, beginning in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, if they caught her in the very act, that means that somehow they had personal understanding of this. I'll give you my interpretation in just a minute. Now, Moses in the law commands us that we should be... that that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They were ready to take her out. The Pharisees, the scribes, they were ready to completely do away with her, to stone her, to kill her, because they had found her in the actual act of adultery. And all that Jesus did was he stooped down and began to write on the ground. He began to write, my guess is he wrote Hebrew, he didn't write English. Y'all will get that later. He stooped down and began to write. And I've heard sermon after sermon of what he wrote. Let me tell you what I believe he wrote. I believe he wrote, adulterers. And they said, well, you know, and he continued to write. And I think he wrote down every one of their names. Because they're the ones that committed the adultery. You see, back in Jesus' day, the rabbis and the men thought that they could get away with it. It was all on the shoulders of the ladies. 
it's the lady's fault. Men were never held accountable for adultery. Now, they say they were, but, but actually, if you read some of the laws and what goes on, they had decided that the men, they get a free pass in this. And here they bring her to, to Jesus to get a free pass of what I believe they had themselves had already done. And they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to him, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. In other words, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out because you have sinned. You have committed the sin that you accuse of her because I've written it on the ground for you. I've written down on the ones that have actually done the sin. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground even that much more than those who had heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the least. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. They all walked away. Why? Because they had been caught. I believe in the sin that they accused her of. Now notice, I want you to notice the loving kindness. I want you to notice God's forgiveness. Forgiveness. I want you to notice his restoration. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are the, those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, let's stop there for just a moment. He asked her, where are your accusers? He asked her, where, where are the ones that have come to accuse you? And he said, they're not here. And then she says one word. One word that tells us of her faith. She calls Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord. And when she called Jesus Lord, that means that she took him by faith. He had saved her life. He put her, she put her faith in him to call him Lord, the Lord God Almighty, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, the one that had come to, to be her Savior too. All in that one word, Lord. And he knew it. And he put his, or why? Because then he will say, neither do I condemn you Condemn you of what? Adultery? Oh yeah. Neither will I condemn you. Why? Because at the moment she trusted the Lord as her personal living Savior, that moment the Lord Jesus wiped away that sin. From the east, as far as the east is from the west, it's all gone. When you were saved, everything up to that point is all gone, all forgiven, all wiped away. It's all out of your life completely. Understand something. That's what Jesus does when he saves you. And he says, I don't condemn you for that. And then I'll give you the, exactly what she said. He told, him to, she, he, she, he told her to do. Go and sin no more. I've forgiven you. Now, decide to live. Go and sin no more. Go and commit adultery no more. Go and sin whatever other sins. No more. Why? Because now she can because the Spirit of God indwells within her. Now she has Jesus Christ on her side. Now she's able to live like she's never lived before because Christ Jesus is now in her life. And yes, it's all because of Christ Jesus that said, go and sin no more. I condemn you not either. And you'll say, well, what happens if she went and committed adultery again? Christian folks sometimes commit adultery. What are they supposed to do? They are to repent, ask God's forgiveness with a contrite heart just like David did, and God will forgive them. He promises that he will do so. You see, all that he tells us, all that is told us here, is that what Jesus does he forgives and tells that individual, go and sin no more. Is it relevant to us? We do not condone 
adultery. It destroys homes and families. But we also have to accept God's grace to forgive. The greatest overriding principle that there is. So many Christians are ready to somehow lay down the law or jump in before we let God do his grace work. There are times we do have to jump in. There are times we do have to say something. There are times we have to, to take a stand, yes. But more than anything else, we need to also allow Jesus to forgive, to restore. And allow that individual to be filled with the Spirit of God that causes a praise to come in our hearts and lives like nothing before. Our first reaction should be of one of love in order to help restore. By God's grace, we are to act as Jesus acted. A marriage may be over. A trust may never be gained, regained. A heart may always be broken. But by God's grace, that individual can be forgiven, can go and sin the sin of adultery no more, and live with a praise in their heart. And yes, we're to have a love and compassion for those that are injured by it. Because there's the injured party that you also look at as well. But let me ask you a question this morning. You may be a person who has, sits here that has at one time in your life committed adultery. Either by action, by thought, or by looks of lust. Guess what? Jesus is ready to receive a repentant heart and to tell you, I forgive you and go and sin no more. He's ready for you to be restored, to be forgiven, to be filled with his praise. And guess, you know what happens when that happens? When God forgives you, of, uh, you know what happens? You sing better. Do you know that? Your life is filled with God's spirit more and more. You sing like a, like a, like a songbird before God. You have, song, you have spirit that, that lives alive in your heart and life. And somehow it just takes over everything that you do. But I also want you to know something. That when you came to the Lord God and asked for repentance and forgiveness and truly asked for that, God gave you that. And you don't have to have it hang over your head, not only by God or anybody else, because God has forgiven you because of it. Because you have done the work of repentance. And shame on us if we decide that we want to take God's step and, and do God's work by somehow not forgiving. Now granted, there will be a way in which that person shows repentance, shows actions, all those things. Yes, we know that. But Jesus says, oh, the beauty of the Lord and what he says and what he did with David. You know, he, he restored David. He forgave and restored David and filled him with, with, his, with his spirit. Guess what? He does the same thing today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to somehow uh, confess sins. My goodness. I just simply want you to go to the Lord and allow him to do a work in you that he's never done before up to this point if this is what has happened. And believe me, he'll bring to your mind any of those times that might have been unfaithful to the Lord and you can throw in, let's throw in all the other commandments that we've looked at. Maybe you've had other gods before you. Hopefully you haven't had any carved images. Lord willing, you haven't taken God's name in vain. That you held the Lord's day highly and made it focus on Him.
that you honored your father and your mother. No murder, no adultery. And I want you to look it back in your life at times in your life that maybe some of those things were not always true before God. And I'm going to ask you this morning, right where you are, to ask forgiveness and allow God's Spirit to flood your heart and your life and everything about Him. now I want you to thank him that he's created in you as he did David a new heart and he's given you the joy of the Lord's salvation in your life again